I'm a standard specialist in the IAEA, IAEA in the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security. And I've worked in the IEA for about 12 years. Um, I work on the content of the safety standards and also on the process that we use to develop them. So you should be able to ask me questions on many aspects of them. We have around 130 safety standards. They cover all sorts of topics from sighting, seismic issues, quite technical things, as far as um, um, regulation, leadership, management, a lot of things about um, radiation protection, transport of radioactive material. So a really very broad spectrum, spectrum of, um, of topics. And we have a, a number of experts who prepare the content. But in the end of the day, the program is managed in a rather centralized way. And there has to be consistency. And um, the output has to be a single output rather than 130 different outputs. So that's why there are people like me in the agency who, who, who are dedicated to working with the safety standards who are experts in, in the standards rather than in the particular topical areas. So the presentation is structured like this. I'm first of all going to give you a, a sort of a brief overview about really what the IA safety standards are, what the context for them is, how regulation international, at an international level works, and then a, a brief history of the safety standards, and then on the third bullet point moving on to today, what is the vision that we work to for the safety standards, what strategies we have in place, what the processes are that we use. I'm going to touch on a couple of recent developments, things that are happening at the moment or have recently happened that have been driving the program. And then um, begin to close by explaining how different states use the safety standards. And then the last couple of slides are just um, really um, websites where you can find further information and a little bit more direction to finding out more about it if you want to. And um, as you did this morning with the presentations, please feel free to interrupt me. If you have any questions, I tend to talk rather fast sometimes, so I would try to slow down. I come from Ireland, so maybe I have an accent that you're not familiar with. Um, and I also get quite enthusiastic about the safety standards. And I forget that not everybody knows everything that I know or is as interested as I am in them. So that sometimes means that I talk in a way you might not understand entirely what I'm talking about. So please interrupt and ask me to explain anything if, if, I, if you lose me. <clears throat> so to start with the, with the overview. So the safety standards fit into something that we call the Global Nuclear Safety and Security Framework. So at the top, we have conventions, treaties, codes of conduct, there are a few abbreviations up there that I'll explain to you. On the left side, there are conventions. The Convention on Nuclear Safety, that's the CNS. It covers um, does quite a lot. Um, basically, most of the countries that have nuclear power plants and many others, too, have signed up to this. And they commit to reviewing their safety every three years and review meetings. The Joint Convention is a very similar convention. It has a, a larger number of um, contracting parties. It covers called a joint convention because it covers two things, um, spent fuel management and radioactive waste management. Maybe it was touched on yesterday slightly. The CPPNM is the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. It covers what we call nuclear security in the IEA. And United Nations Security Council Resolution 1540 covers non-proliferation. So these are conventions, and there, there are others as well. There are conventions relating to emergencies to notification of accidents and so on, that, that the IEA has some role to play in, either as a depository. But, but basically, they are, they are treaties that states have signed up to and have committed to. So they're legal treaties. On the right-hand side, there are codes of conduct. We have two codes of conduct. They cover research reactors and safety and security of radiation sources, two different publications. They're, um, they're not quite as, as they're not, not legally binding in the way the conventions are, but they're still legal instruments that states try to adhere to. And um, many of these, particularly the ones relating to safety rather than security or non-proliferation, they're what we call um, soft law or incentive law. So the, the, there's really just an incentive to do what you signed up to do. There's not there's going to be a punishment if you don't manage to do it. Um, at the bottom, then, we have the application. In the real world, we've got operation, we've got actual regulation by regulators, national regulators, 
So what's happening at a national level? And then in between, we have what the IEA does. So we've got the safety standards and security guidance on the left, safety reviews and services that Peter's going to talk about later, and the global knowledge network. So that's the way that the IEA assists states to interact with one another and to share knowledge about safety. So these three things um, are the day-to-day -day work of our Department of Nuclear Safety. And I would even, if I were to draw this diagram, I would put the safety standards in the middle of it. Because without the safety standards, the Department of Nuclear Safety and Security in the IEA has nothing to do. Everything that we do derives from the safety standards. All of the safety review missions, all the assistance we give to states in, in relation to safety, it all aims to assist states in meeting the IEA safety standards. So that's where they fit in on a sort of global context. And the IEA is, is um, entitled or obligated to establish safety standards. So the IEA was established in 1957, and the statute was written at that time. And Article 3A6 refers specifically to safety standards. It's one of the core functions of the IEA to establish or adopt standards of safety for protection of health and minimization of danger to life and property. That's to, to write the safety standards, or to take them from somewhere else, but to establish them, to put the IEA's name to them. And then on the right, to, to provide for the application, so to assist states in applying the safety standards. So we have to do it. It's part of our core functions. It's as important a function of the IEA as, as um, being a nuclear weapons inspector. It's one of those ones that it, it's, been going, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, so, and then another thing you, I think you need to sort of think about as well before we start into how, how the safety standards work in, in detail is how they, how they are important for you as a national regulator or as a national operator. The regulation of safety is, is a national responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the IEA. Each country itself is, is responsible for regulating safety in its own country. And the prime responsibility for safety is with the operator. We had a slight discussion on that this morning. And in fact, that's principle one of the IEA fundamental safety principles, that there is only one person can hold responsibility. If too many people have responsibility, then nobody has responsibility. So the prime responsibility for safety is with the operator. But what do the IEA safety standards do then? So they're not legally binding. So member states don't have to use them, but they can if they wish. They are binding for us, for anything that we do. If we um, are assisting states with providing um, some equipment, we have to make sure that the, the, the state will meet the safety standards before they can accept the equipment. And that, that more relates to, sorry, to the third bullet point. So in relation to our operations assisting states and for our own activities, so any work that we do with radioactive material, we have to meet our own safety standards in that respect. So although states do not have to use them, we'll find towards the end of the presentation that increasingly many states do use the safety standards and for, for different reasons. So the history of the safety standards goes, goes back quite a way. You can see the first one was published in 1958, so just one year after the IEA was established. In fact, this was the very first publication of the IEA. The first time we published anything was this book, Safe Handling of Radioisotopes, Safety Series Number 1. Um, then... Another, trans another safety standard that still exists to this day, although it's changed quite a bit since then, is safe transport of radioactive material, sometimes called the transport regulations. And in fact, this is the most widely used safety standard because you can't transport any radioactive material unless you have an agreement between the two states from one to another that you're transporting it in a way that both can accept. So that was the first edition of that was published in 1961. The first edition of the Basic Safety Standards for Radiation Protection, sometimes called the BSS, was published in 1962. And then the very first waste-related safety standard was published in 1965. So you can see it, it's gone back quite a while. And these had a rather old-fashioned front cover, of course, and they were part of what we call the safety series. So the history, really, from 1958, the first 40 years, the idea, the, the way it was, was groups of experts on these particular topics were brought together, and they wrote a book. And then that got an IEA logo on the front, and it became the standard that you had to meet. So it was sort of a, a bottom-up approach. We chose experts in different areas, and then they you know, wrote what they thought was the most important thing to write. And, then, and it, it came together, and there was a great collection of experience put together. There were safety practices, lists of things that had happened. Some guidance was put together. But bit by bit, it began to change. 
and the, the requirements, so the sort of more high level standards began to emerge from this. In the beginning, there was no difference between what's a requirement, what's guidance, what's just a suggestion. There was no real distinction made. But bit by bit, it, it came to the stage that, that there were certain statements that were more important than others. So the requirements came out of this. The, the um, safety standards, rather than then becoming lots of individual books, began to be grouped together in four structured programs. So we had a program on nuclear safety, a program on radiation protection, a program on waste, and a program on transport. And those programs all worked, those four worked sort of individually. And then um, three safety fundamentals, so really quite high level statements derived from that. The, the one that didn't get a safety fundamentals was transport. So nuclear, radiation protection, and waste. Each one had a sort of statement of their fundamental principles that they issued, and, and that, that was the way things were in 1996. Um, but then, over the next 10 years, some changes happened. So some internal reorganization happened in the IEA. Nuclear safety became recognized as being separate from operations. So whereas, par whereas previously, the nuclear safety department had been sort of a, a section or a division within our nuclear energy department, which assist states with improving their technology, um, it then became separate. It was recognized that nuclear safety deserved to be separate. That was the nuclear safety department was established in 1996. And then, rather than having four separate programs, the idea came that the four separate programs should be brought together under the Commission of Safety Standards. And then in 2006, the, a unified safety fundamentals was finally published. So the three existing safety fundamentals were, um, were reviewed, and it was determined that some of the content of them was not really at a sort of fundamental principle level, and it was brought together, and the, the things that were, were common among the three books were, were rewritten in this fundamental safety principles, which I really encourage you to read. It's written, it's only about uh, 20 pages long. It's written in very nice and easy language, and it really sets, sets out the, the concepts and the principles to which we work. So this is the way the situation was up, to, up until 2006. And to this day, the Commission on Safety Standards guides our work. So they're, um, they're senior regulators. So probably in any of your countries, um, we don't have every, every member state of the IEA rep rep represented on the Commission on Safety Standards. But if you have a nuclear power plant, your, your country is certainly represented there. And it's the most senior regulator in your country is on the Commission on Safety Standards. And they meet twice a year, and they provide guidance on the approach for the safety standards, and they endorse the texts of the safety standards. So they, they don't work at a, at a technical level. They work more at a political level, and they give a seal of approval to all the technical work that is done below. So the, safe, the Commission on Safety Standards is very active. They have very firm ideas of the way that the IEA safety standards program should go. And um, we, we, we follow their, their instruction. And we also give them suggestions as well. So we also have some very clear ideas ourselves. So it's, 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 a, it's a very good working relationship. Yes. For the Commission on Safety Standards, it's, it's the senior, most senior regulator. We have also got, um, uh, for the Commission on Safety Standards, it, it is always the chief regulator. Um, we also have these other committees, NUSC, RASC, WASC, and TRANS, so the Nuclear Safety Standards Committee, Waste Safety Standards Committee, Radiation Safety and Transport Safety Standards Committee. In that case, the country will nominate the technical expert in the area. But at the higher level, it is the senior regulator in that case. So then, since the Unified Safety Fundamentals were published, some changes took place. It was, it was recognized that um, this bottom-up approach was now part of the past. We wanted to have a more top-down approach with the new fundamentals. A roadmap was established for a long-term structure of the safety requirements. And the idea was to integrate all of the safety standards together into one gigantic book with 130 volumes. And some other developments took place since then. The, um, there was a recognition that safety and security, nuclear security, are very closely related. So bit by bit, through the Joint Advisory Group on Nuclear Security, um, there was a, 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 a sort of task force put together to see how this could happen. And, and in 2012, the Nuclear Security Guidance Committee was added to those four committees I mentioned before, 
There was then a fifth committee which covered nuclear security guidance and has nuclear security experts. And nuclear security is very broad. It's not just, of course, the nuclear regulator who's interested in that. It's law enforcement, it's border control, all sorts of people are interested in nuclear security guidance. So it's, a, it's quite a different, um, a different range of people have been brought into the process. And nuclear security series is another series of publications in the IEA that are related to the safety standards, but, is, but still separate. And then uh, a sixth committee was actually added. The Emergency Preparedness and Response Standards Committee was added to the, to the five existing ones. So now we have six committees underneath the safety standards. Well, the Nuclear Security Guidance Committee is off to one side, but um, these technic at, the, at a technical level. Um, so this was a, a concrete response to the Fukushima accident, and the, um, the idea is that the Emergency Preparedness and Response Standards Committee, which itself also has a lot of um, experts outside the regulator necessarily, has, or anybody who might be involved in a, in a response to a nuclear emergency, there's um, a lot of efforts there to make the, the guidance and the standards on emergency preparedness and response consistent and appropriate. So that brings us to where we are today. And this is the vision we work to for the safety standards. The IA safety standards should be the global reference for protecting people and the environment. So the idea is that we would have an integrated, comprehensive set of standards. So all 130 books are properly integrated. They don't contradict one another. And they cover everything that needs to be covered. They don't leave anything out. They should be internationally agreed. So we can't just ignore the concerns of the member states. Member states should have an opportunity, an extensive opportunity, to comment on them and, and, and guide the development of them. They should be coherent, so they should make sense. They should be consistent with one another. They should be fit for purpose. They should be use, useful. They shouldn't be incomprehensible. And they should, should be of a high quality. It's not that we're going for the, the lowest common denominator here. We're, we're really looking to establish standards for safety that really enhance safety. They need to be kept up to date and continuously improved as technology changes and as knowledge increases. They should be scientifically uh, based on, on, on. They should be scientifically sound. They sh they should not just be numbers plucked from thin air, but they should be well derived. And we, we we the IEA doesn't do scientific work in that respect itself. It works with the um, UNSCEAR, which is the United Nations Committee. Uh, oh gosh, what does it stand for? Thank you. Good. Um, I can't remember what it stands for, but they, they, they gather a lot of a lot of the original research on um, the effects, the health effects of radiation, and um, the ICRP. And somebody will tell me what that stands for now. You know, International Committee for Radiation Protection, um, so or radiological protection, I think they call it. They also do a lot of the of the very basic research on health effects of radiation, and and their work feeds into the safety standards. They do, they don't set guidance, they don't set norms. But they, they do the science behind it, and we use their, their knowledge to develop the safety standards. And the objective then is that we should have a, a level of safety that is globally harmonized, so it's the same everywhere in the world and at a high level, not higher or lower in different places. Because if we have an accident in one place somewhere, it, it is really an accident everywhere. It, it, has a, it is a problem for every state, no matter where the accident takes place. So it has to be at a high level everywhere. So what we now have at the moment are safety standards, different, three different safety standards categories. You'll see the front covers are a bit different from the front covers from the 1960s. Um, and it's been really well clarified into three different levels. We have one, safety fundamentals. It contains the safety objective, which I think Peter mentioned this morning, to protect people and the environment from harmful effects of radiation. And 10 principles, the first one being that uh, it's the operator who's, who's responsible for safety. And that's, it's, it's really a very nice book to look at. Then we have uh, 14 safety requirements. Some of them are general safety requirements that apply to everyone, so about um, the regulatory body or about leadership and management, um, about emergency preparedness. And then other ones are, more, are specific to different, um, different facilities. So we have ones on nuclear power plants, fuel cycle facilities, waste disposal facilities, research reactors, transport. So they're arranged in different ways, either topical or facility specific, but there, there are 14 of those. And then we have another 110 roughly safety guides. And the safety guides indicate how the safety requirements can be met. They don't have to be met in this way, 
there could be alternative ways of meeting the safety requirements, but um, they at least should be as good as, if, if you choose a different approach, it should be as good as or better than what's set out in the safety guides. And we use different language in each of these three categories. We use the word must in the fundamental safety principles, shall in the requirements, and should in the safety guides. And um, with that, we hope to make it clear what's, what's more and what's less important to be met. So these are the, this is the structure we have at the moment. On the left, so the, the blue safety fundamentals on the top, in the middle, the red safety requirements. We have general safety requirements. Those are the topical ones. And in fact, we don't call those numbers one to seven. We call them part one to part seven because they have to be looked at as a, as a whole. So whatever your facility is that, you're, um, that, that, that needs to be made safe, you have to look at all parts one to part seven. And then on, on the right, the specific safety requirements specific to different facilities. The nuclear, nuclear power plant safety requirements, because they're quite more elaborate, they've been broken up into two parts, one in design and one in operation, but it's still the same, the same book. Um, so that's the structure that exists at the moment. And to get to that, that vision and those categories, the, 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 those safety standards, we have quite an elaborate management system to make this happen. So we set out our strategies for achieving this. The first one being having uh, that we need to have clear categories. We have those, the three categories you saw. There needs to be a very clear, logical, and integrated structure. So it has to make sense the way they work. The scope has to be clear. And in fact, the beginning of every book, the scope is set out. What facility does this apply to? What, more, more importantly, sometimes, what does it not apply to? So it has to be very clear what safety standards you should use at any one time. There needs to be consensus on the safety standards at the highest level. That's why we've developed the system with the Commission on Safety Standards. They need to be user-friendly. Part of that is um, the language they're written in, the style, the, um, the accessibility of them, the fact that they're, for example, all available on the internet without any fee. There needs to be a manageable number. We, we could conceivably write 1,000 safety standards, but we probably couldn't manage to keep them up to date. With the resources that we have in the IEA and the resources that the member states have to devote to this, because it's always extra work from their national regulation, we can usually update about 10 safety standards a year. So if we have 130 and we can only update 10 a year, you can recognize that it's roughly at every 10 or 11 or 12 years that we can revise them. And, and technology could change faster than that. So we, we can't actually have more than what we have at the moment. It's, it's really, the number has to be limited to some extent. The processes have to be clear, because otherwise, how do the member states know how to get involved if we haven't set out clearly how to, how to be involved? Um, they need to be rigorous and they need to be efficient. And we need to involve the right stakeholders. We need to have proper feedback mechanisms. So when something has been published, we need to make sure that people are using it. And if they're using it and not liking it, they have to be able to tell us and we have to respond to that. The terminology we use in all of those different areas, from transport to nuclear power plants to leadership, has to be somehow consistent and harmonized. Even though the jargon in the different areas might be quite different, somehow the terminology needs to be consistent because people can pick up any of the books and read them. We should promote the safety standards, make sure they do get used. And we should also be aware of the interface between safety and nuclear security. because. There are, of course, situations, I'm sure you can imagine them, um, in a nuclear power plant, if the door is locked, it might be secure, but not safe, because the operator in an accident cannot suddenly get out if he needs to, but you can make sure that the bad guys don't get in. So there, there are tensions between safety and nuclear security that need to be managed. So this is the process that we use, the sketch of the process that we use to develop the safety standards. And it looks uh, quite complicated here, and I can assure you it's even more complicated than that. It takes roughly five years for a safety standard to be developed from scratch. And it may seem like a very long time, but the time it takes is um, it, it allows as many stakeholders as possible to be involved in the, in the development of the standards. So we start out with a work plan that the Secretariat prepares. We have technical experts in the different areas. So for example, Peter is the expert in nuclear power plant operation. He would prepare a work plan. And it would be reviewed by the safety standards committees and the Commission on Safety Standards. And only when they are happy 
with the work plan, which might in itself take a couple of years to develop and get consensus on. Um, only then can we actually proceed with writing the safety standard. So it begins with drafting. We get consultants in from member states, different experts, and they put together a draft, a first draft, or a pretty good first draft after a while. That might in itself take a year, depending on how long. It's not just that the, the, the expert staff member of the IA does the work, but really there's a lot of effort made to get expertise from the member states in. And when a good draft has been prepared, the review committees, that's the NUSC, RASC, WASC, EPRESC, these technical committees who are also at quite a high level, they get a chance to review it and they say, yes, it's good enough to send to member states. And that means we enable all member states of the IA, we have 160 member states, we officially, through diplomatic channels, request them to give comments on this draft of the safety standard. And we allow them 120 days to do so. And it's, it's not very long, actually, because you know, the processes within different countries can be longer or shorter. By the time the person in the embassy is notified of this to they, until they pass it on to the, to the person, the, the coordinator in the country, who's going to do it until they pass it out to the different experts in the different areas and get all the comments back in and sort them out and make sure that they're not inconsistent and send them back to the IA. It's, it's 120 days is a pretty short time. It's four months and it's not very long. Um, then that com that, all those comments back can come back in and there's a, a technical officer in the IA whose job it is in each, for each safety standard, different te technical officer for each safety standard. It's their job to resolve these comments. And then you can also imagine that there's quite a lot of conflict between the comments because countries will have wildly different ideas of what is appropriate to write in there. So that's quite challenging. Um, then the review committees get another chance to look at the, at the draft, and they often help with resolving the, comment, the comments from the member states if they couldn't be resolved by a technical officer. And sometimes that takes a couple of goals as well. These review committees, they meet twice a year. So if they don't approve it one time, you've got to wait another six months until they do it again, until they can see it again. So you can see that this is building up to quite a long process overall, but certainly in a process with, a, with an involvement of a lot of stakeholders. And finally, when the draft is technically very good, and also when it has been technically edited and ensured that the, that the language is consistent with the IEA safety standards approach, that there's no Con there, there, there are no contradictions with another safety standard that has been published, when, when it's really in a very, very good state, except for perhaps a couple of typos and so on, then it will be given for endorsement to the Commission on Safety Standards. And usually they just endorse it. And sometimes they don't, but usually they do. And if, if it is the safety fundamentals or safety requirements, it then goes to the IEA's Board of Governors, which is at the ambassador level. And again, because they're convinced that our process has been done rigorously and properly, and because we have convinced them of that, they usually also agree to the safety standard and establish it. And then it's sent for publication. So it turns into a book, and it's put as a PDF on the website. And it can be used. So this is the, um, the process. We have written it down in, in quite an elaborate um, manual or number of manuals to follow, because you can imagine the interaction between technical things and diplomatic things is quite hard to manage sometimes. So, yes, this is more what the process looks like in real life. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Previous slide? That's a very good question. Well, that kind of thing is decided at the very beginning, the outline of the work plan. It would never change its category as it's being drafted. So it's right at the very start, the very first box here. Um, there would be The proposal would be put forward for a safety guide or safety requirements. But it also has to be in line with what I described as the long-term structure that was established in 2008 and agreed by the Commission on Safety Standards. So the Commission on Safety Standards doesn't just endorse individual book standards, but it, it has a, a, a concept in mind. So we, we have a sort of a, a list of standards that we're working to, and we don't expect to develop others beyond that. Um, the standards are written in a way that is um, technologically neutral. So if there is a new development of, for example, a pebble bed reactor, it doesn't matter. The, um, 
the same standards that applied for another type of nuclear reactor will also apply for a new, new nuclear reactor. Now, there are, there are you know, things that are happening. For example, we're not entirely sure if our safety standards are appropriate for small modular reactors at the moment. We, we, we think they are, but we haven't really gone into a huge amount of detail about that. So there, there are technological changes which could eventually affect um, a change in the safety standards structure and the concepts as a whole, but not at the moment. Um, what does happen, what is more likely to happen is that there will be a request to revise a safety standard earlier than had been anticipated because of something, for example, the Fukushima accident happening or something like that. Um, so, but a new topic is, is rare. It's, it's pretty well established at this stage what topics we should cover. Yes. Okay. Which one are you on? Nusk. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, according to the process, we um, allow, we, we, we upload to the website before every meeting, two months before every meeting, all the drafts that would be subject to review. And we expect you to review all six of them within the two months. Now, depending, of course, which, which um, office you're from, but you may have a huge infrastructure at home backing you up to do that and have plenty of people you could outsource that work to, or you might have to do it all yourself. So some of the, uh, some of the member states manage to review all of them um, because they have a lot of people who are dedicated to this work. But of course, that's not the case for all of them. So this, was a, this, is, this relates to what I was talking about, the manageable number of safety standards. And, and I agree, particularly in the NUSC area, there are a huge number of safety standards. And it could well be that we have surpassed the manageable number at this stage. Because if you don't review them, properly, if you don't have time, then we don't really know if we've written something useful or not. And if it's not useful, it won't be used. So there was no point in doing the whole work in the, in the first place. So certainly that is a kind of interesting feedback to get that you know, we may need to cut the number of safety standards, or we may need to consider whether putting, we should put more emphasis on certain topics and ask for dedicated review of those and let the others just go. So there, there are certain challenges the process as a whole. Yes. Um, do you want to answer this one, Peter? Because you've probably uh, had more detail on. On, on a recent. Well, the practice, the practice for resolving is through the review committees, but if you can think of an example of contradictory comments, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, how, how we sort of do it into the process? So, you know, when a document is placed on the committee, it's placed on the committee, and then it's placed on the committee, and then it's placed on the committee, and then it's placed on the committee. Me, as someone who sections the review committee, will take all the comments that are The way that I think most people do it is we then construct a um, table resolution. Uh, where we, we will gather all the comments together, uh, so they're all gathered together in the individual clauses uh, or by individual sections. Um, we can then say, okay, so we've got a comment on uh, section X point one, whatever that is. Um, we will we review it and say, well, okay, is this a fundamental comment about this whole issue? Or uh, you know, is it less serious? Is it just putting up you know, the wording? So um, we'll gather all the technical ones together. And if, if, if there is a disagreement, you know, one country wants it one way, one country wants it another way, 
then you know, we have to go out and talk to those countries and say, well, they employ both these markets and some side of the So what what is the kind of issue? And could we word it a different way that will allow you to accept what we're trying to say um, you know, in, in a way that everybody else can also accept? So it, it really is a matter of technical negotiation. And uh, you know, we actually sit down and talk to people. So the people will get on the phone. Yes, yeah, and, and we have to because it, it, we can't possibly resolve all of them. Um, that, that's what I wanted to show with this slide here, um, that um, although we do have this rigorous process in place, as Peter mentioned, a lot of it is down to individual negotiation with particular commenters. And sometimes the, even the comments from the particular country will be contradictory if they've got a couple of experts to comment on something, even those experts will have contradicted one another. And then the coordinator in that country will have sent them on to the IA. And what are we supposed to do if you know, France can't agree what its position is on this? You know, it's even more difficult for us to resolve it then. So a lot of it is individual negotiation. There are, um, I hesitate to say this, but it, it is somehow true that although we have a very rigorous 14-step process, in the 12 years that I've worked at the IEA, I don't think even one safety standard has precisely followed that process. There's always been some kind of deviation in order to achieve this consensus, which is such a challenge to achieve. So a lot of it is um, through personal contacts, um, knowing the experts, knowing how one could resolve. You know, I, I, well, if I, if I take it out here, but I put it in here instead, would that work? Oh, yes, that would work. So, be, you know, being creative in, in finding solutions and so on. So it, it's quite a challenge for the technical officer who has to manage the development of a new safety standard. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that, that's all part of the drafting stage of putting together the first draft. The consultancy meeting might have five or six really good experts whom the technical officer happens to know from different countries. But it's, it's a out good outcome from a consultancy meeting doesn't mean that you have a consensus over all IEA member states. So you might move on to a technical meeting as well where you invite a lot of other countries to be involved. So that is, um, that each safety standard, depending on the topic as well, depending on the length of it, some of them are 20 pages long, some of them are 180 pages long, um, depending on whether they're very technical or we have one on, uh, for example, communication that everybody commented on because everybody knows about communication. So it's, uh, you, know, you might get a very few number of comments. For example, in the fuel cycle area, we don't have that many countries that have fuel cycle facilities um, or certain, well, let's say re reprocessing facilities or something, something where the, the, there's not a great number of countries in the world doing this. And then in transport, you'll have every country involved. So it's, it's, um, it varies very much depending on the safety standard. Go ahead. That's correct, yes, the Board of Governors. Yeah. Um, the safety centers are never bi never binding, even if they've gone up to the Board of Governors. Yes, yeah, then it will be binding, yeah. So it has never happened that the IA has voted on a safety standard, the, uh, the Board of Governors. It, um, I'm not sure of the Board of Governors' procedures if it would ever be possible to do that. Um, the most dramatic thing that I have ever witnessed is that a safety standard was taken off the agenda once in advance before it could be discussed because again the personal connections it was made known to us that a certain member state was not happy with a particular statement in a particular safety standard and would be unlikely to endorse it at the board so in order to avoid that diplomatic embarrassment it was taken off the agenda and a completely different approach was 
the, the statement was taken out on the condition that that member state, which was conducting a process which we didn't want to endorse, would then um, undergo a safety review mission to see if their process was safe or not. So a completely, you know, quite quite an unusual approach was taken to to bringing that safety standard forward. So, um, but at the board level, usually it's it's a question of rubber stamping because the work has gone on in advance. There's also, there are um, briefings to the board in advance where they get to ask the really nasty questions and they ho hopefully have their, um, their concerns assured. But at the moment we have a safety standard on nuclear fuel cycle facilities that's going to the board next month. Um, and so far I have heard that it will go through. One always knows somehow in advance that it will be fine. And, and I hope that that is the case. I hope nobody changes their minds about that. It's quite difficult to withdraw something and then put it back on. So, um, so now I want to just bring you up to date with a couple of things that we've been working on recently over the last couple of years. Um, after the Fukushima accident, the IAA developed an action plan and it covered a lot of different areas and one of the areas was the IAA safety standards. And there was a request by the member states of the IEA in, then at the end of 2011 to look at the safety standards and see if they really were fit for purpose or if, you know, there was really, if the safety standards had, had been better, perhaps the Fukushima accident wouldn't have happened, you know, that, to look like that, to look at that scenario. Um, so that was, the, the request was to review and strengthen the IEA safety standards and to improve their implementation. So. We conducted a, a very rigorous systematic review of all of the safety standards and we took into account the lessons that had been learned from the Fukushima accident. The, we couldn't look at all 130, it would have been unwieldy, so we looked particularly at the safety requirements that are applicable to nuclear power plants and to the storage of spent fuel. And we used the feedback from the national evaluations, different countries' evaluations of Fukushima accident. We looked at the EU stress tests that had gone on in the intervening years. Um, we had a number of high-level international expert meetings, meetings of the Convention on Nuclear Safety. All of the input from that was looked at and a gap analysis was drawn up to see did, were the safety standards adequate? If they had been better, would the Fukushima accident have occurred? And the, the result of that was that there were actually determined to be no major gaps in the safety standards. So it wasn't that the safety standards were lacking. Nevertheless, we took the opportunity to strengthen them somewhat. So I, I talk here about overarching requirements and associated paragraphs and things. The, the, the requirements are structured in a way that there are some, there's some text in bold, some shall statements in bold. We call those overarching requirements. And then there's some associated requirements. They're not less important, but topically they're related to the overarching requirements. So there were no new overarching requirements. We made a few changes to the... Um, to, to, to some of the overarching requirements. This is, now I'm talking about all safety requirements now. Um, and modified an addition, a few paragraphs and added a few additional paragraphs. But the idea was, wasn't that the safety standards were lacking, it's just we took an opportunity to strengthen them in the light of the lessons from the Fukushima accident. And we've just, I mentioned that the process takes five years, so we've just come to the end of that process. And in fact, the last one on the list, the safety of nuclear fuel cycle facilities, it, it's the one I'm talking about going to the board next, next month. We expect it will be published at the end of the year. So you can see that we addressed our government and legal and regulatory framework for safety, leadership and management, safety assessment, preparedness and response for nuclear emergency. We looked at site evaluation, the safety of nuclear power plants, both the design and the operation, and the safety of research reactors. So all of those safety requirements were looked at. Some of them were revised in a way that we call by amendment, so just a few small tweaks. And some of them were completely rewritten because they were really very old. For example, the safety of research reactors hadn't been issued since, I think, 2005. So it was really due a complete revision at that point. Same with the safety, well, the safety of nuclear fuel cycle facilities as well. So leadership and management for safety was also completely rewritten. So there, there were different approaches to it. But all of these new safety requirements published this year and last year, uh, 2015, I think the earliest one, they all responded to the, to the strengthening of the requirements that had been requested following the Fukushima accident.
against the radical action. For the small modular reactors. Yeah. So I don't know why they want to from the beginning, why they don't that somehow not the beginning. Why they didn't take take the opportunity at this point to bring in the SMRs, you mean? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, there, there isn't agreement on, on this at the moment as to whether the safety standards do or do not adequately cover the SMRs. It's, it's not, uh, some countries believe it, they do and some believe they don't. So it, it's not, there's no consensus at the moment as to whether, whether we need to revise them. They should follow the, the safety requirements that exist. I don't think that is the case because, um, well, I, I actually I don't know because I'm, I'm not an expert in SMRs, but um, my understanding is that the, the way that the safety requirements have been written is that the same concepts and principles can also be applied. I think Peter explained that in a certain way this morning as well. So it is, you're right, it is something we, we should look at. I mean, I shouldn't just discount it entirely. Um, the reason we didn't do it now was that there was an agreement among member states to focus on the lessons learned from Fukushima. So there were not lessons relating to SMRs learned from Fukushima. It's a separate topic. So there was a, somehow an, a concern in, the develop, in these, re, these revisions that if we allow another topic in, like SMRs, then somebody else will want another topic in, and somebody else will want another topic in, and you know, then the whole thing will be up for grabs and we'll never get to the end of the process. It was important, also politically, that we do actually issue these in a timely manner, at least within five years after the Fukushima accident. If, if we had opened them up fully for a complete revision, it might be 10 or 15 years before we actually can come to come any kind of agreement on it. So th there are other, other issues other than te technical issues that go into the decisions here. So this was the output anyway from, from the revisions following the Fukushima accident. Yes, there is. And um, it is, in fact, what I mentioned before, in 1996, so 10 years after Chernobyl, the nuclear Department of Nuclear, nuclear Safety and Security was established. It took 10 years from Chernobyl up to the restructuring of the IEA, the establishment of a, of a combined program with the Commission of Safety Standards. So that's, that was the response to Chernobyl. It's sort of a, it was quite, also quite a sort of a long-term thing. Um, so we, we do respond to things. It, I, it wasn't that you know, we issued a few new safety standards, but it was, it was really quite a significant change was made then. So, um, and this is something else that is quite new. I wanted to sort of advertise a little bit. Um, we t I talked about the safety standards should be user friendly, and part of that is accessibility. And you might have been a bit confused when I was talking about the fact that there are 130 safety standards, and how could anybody possibly be able to navigate their way through them? And it is pretty difficult to understand. I mean, even as an expert, sometimes I get lost and can't remember where things are. But we've established um, a content management system. So it's a, it's a computer system. Um, it contains all the safety standards, but more than just the books themselves, it contains links between them. And it's also used to develop the safety standards at the moment, or, or we're doing it on a pilot basis. We're not using it for all of them at the moment, but for some of them. So the idea is that when we review or revise safety standards, it should be done on the basis of really systematic collection of feedback and not just at a whim. Um, and this, the, any revisions have to be justified so that the safety standards remain stable. They should be technically consistent. So we, we have to make sure that they're all consistent with one another to be able to look at all of them at once. Um, semantically consistent, which means that the language, the terminology should be the same in all of them. Um, we can check that they are, um, they're complete by doing a, a gap analysis rather easily. And um, the, the main thing I think that is interesting for you if you're going to be using safety standards is that they're, they're more accessible now. So that's the, the link. I, I'm not sure, will the students be able to get the, the slides, Ashok? No, okay, good. So you'll get all the links anyway. And you don't need to note them down. Um, so for accessibility of the, of the safety standards, it's, it's pretty good. So we have on the left, here, um, if you open up a safety standard in the NSS We system, the um, my boss who got the system together is French. And he's very happy that it's a French abbreviation <laughs> for it. Um, so uh, on the left here, we have what you would see if you open up, for example, GSR Part Six and decommissioning. So not just the text. This is how the book would start 
but you would also be given a good deal of information on what, what other safety standards you might want to look at. And then within each safety standard, you can see the links between all the requirements. You can see how they link to the different safety guides. You can see how they would interface with these other books, which are the Nuclear Security Series books. And you'd also be able to see, get information on the safety glossary and be able to see um, what the definition of, is of all of the, the terms we use. Because we do use terms in a sometimes a pretty unusual way. I mean, for example, radioactive material is not usually used in its scientific sense rather than its regulatory sense. So it's not that the material is radioactive, but that the material is an activity above a certain level that it needs then to be regulated. So there are certain, aware, certain terms that are used in a rather unusual way in the safety standards. So that you can see the terms, the terms here will be highlighted and the abbreviation will pop out. And you can also search in a different way. There's interesting drop-down menus if you're interested in a particular facility or a particular aspect of the facility, you can, you can look through it. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's going to be a pretty cool resource um, for access from the outside and also for our development of the safety standards. So to finish up, or to go rather quickly now, how are the safety standards used? Because I said they're not binding on, on, on member states. So, but, but some states do actually formally adopt them into their national regulations. Some of them adapt them slightly. Um, they're also referenced. Or they're used as a source of, of uh, there are some source material to develop national regulations. And the, the way we know who's using the safety standards for what is through the review committees and through the Commission on Safety Standards. At every one of these meetings, we ask, we take it in turns and ask the member state to explain how they use the safety standards. And so those are the sort of the general, the four approaches that people use, that states use. Um, they're also used as a sort of benchmarking exercise. So they're not directly in the national regulations, but the national regulations are benchmarked periodically against the safety standards to see if they're up to scratch. And again, they can be used directly. Um, some of them are used more than others. So, for example, the transport regulations, I mentioned they're used worldwide. The basic safety standards are also um, almost universally accepted. Many of our safety standards are not just established by the IAEA, but also by many other UN organizations, such as the World Health Organization. And some of those other UN organizations have more member states than we have. So we have 160, but I think the World Health Organization has 190. So it increases the, the expansion to other smaller member states who may actually really want to use these safety standards directly. Um, the European Commission has incorporated safety fundamentals directly into EU regulate, legislation. And uh, WENRA also used the safety standards for a benchmarking exercise uh, around eight or ten years ago to harmonize the national regulations in Western Europe. So those were different ways that they've been used. And then here are some, uh, some links. So the, this is the safety standards website. On the top, there's an awful lot of information on that about the safety standards. This file here, the status, is updated very, very frequently, at least once a month. So at the moment, we have 129 safety standards published. It stays around 130 because sometimes one new safety standard comes out and replaces two, or sometimes one is split into two, depending on how, how the development has gone. We usually have around 50 at any one time in revision. So 130 roughly published, 50 in revision. Um, there are, in, within this PDF file, there are, other, there are hyperlinks to the safety standards. We, the IA has six official languages. Um, which I'm sure you guys know. Can you tell me what they are? The official languages of the IA? English. English. Russian. French. Yeah, French, you mentioned Russian. Exactly. Yeah, Russian. So, so the work is done in English, but um, some of them are translated and not all of them. So the safety fundamentals and the safety requirements are all translated into all official languages. And, um, and then we run out of money because we don't have enough money to translate all of the safety guides, unfortunately. Some of them are translated because we get um, individual financial contributions from different member states who are particularly interested in a particular language and a particular topic. So we managed to get some of the safety guides translated, but we don't have all of them, unfortunately, don't have all of them translated um, into all languages. Um, and in fact, the, it is quite a challenge, as you can imagine, to translate all of this. We have um, professional translators in the IEA, but they have a lot of other work to do as well, not just the safety standards. Um, so sometimes there are difficulties with getting the meaning right and so on. And, and actually, unlike other cases where 
sometimes people say, well, the, the original language is the authoritative one, English is the authoritative one. That's not the case here. Actually, all of them are authoritative, which is a bit difficult if they, if they contradict one another. So that's something we have to resolve, and we do a lot of work with the translators to make sure that, um, that, that the translations are as good as they possibly can be. Then the safety glossary is another great resource. It exists in the, in the six official languages, and it, it explains all of these terms and how they're used. We don't have a glossary. We don't have a definition for every single technical term or every single term. Some terms you can open a dictionary, you find, the, find what that is, and then you use that. So there's only specific ones that are used in an unusual way and where the context needs to be explained and so on. That, those, those appear in the safety glossary. And then if you want to access all of the safety standards, you can download them. This is a link to the English version, but I think that the, you can also download all the language ones as well in one go. It's a huge file of very many megabytes. Um, so yeah, the final remarks. The safety standards, they present an international consensus on what constitutes a high level of safety. They aim to protect health, minimize danger to life and property. They're based on an international consensus. And they are consistent, provide a technically sound basis for decision making. Many states use them for national regulations. And they're applied by regulatory bodies and operators in nuclear, energy, nuclear, gener nuclear power generation. They're also used by the IEA in its projects and its safety review missions. And they support and are consistent with the international treaties, the conventions, and the codes of conduct. So if you have any questions, you can ask me now, or we can wait until after the coffee break. We have a discussion forum then at that point. Thank you very much. <laughs>